Good morning, First Baptist Church, Windermere. How's everyone doing today? Good? Everyone survived the Thanksgiving holidays, so that is, that's a good thing, uh, and you guys have gotten over your turkey coma. Uh, a couple of things that we want to do this morning. First of all, we want to welcome our Lakeside campus. Can we do that? Give a huge welcome to Lakeside. Say thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you guys for being here each and every week, as well as those of you that are online watching. Thank you very, very much. Uh, my name is Russ Donahoe. I am the campus pastor at Lakeside, as well as family ministries pastor. And people ask me, what is a family ministries pastor? Well, basically, I administrate from preschool all the way to Cornerstone. And with such a wide range of ages, you can only imagine the questions uh, that sometimes come up. Uh, whenever dealing with all of those ages. Uh, online, uh, some of the, the online Bibles have, have listed some of the phrases, the questions that they've been asked about phrases that people thought were in the Bible, but they really aren't. Uh, they've gotten some really bad emails from people asking, why is this not here? I thought it was in the Bible, but it's not. A, a couple of those phrases uh, that, that they've, they've listed are these, uh, God helps those who help themselves. Uh, that is not in scripture, <laughs> um, but apparently some people think it is, and they're sending nasty messages online <laughs> that it is. Uh, here's another one. Money is the root of all evil. Now, some of you Bible scholars will say, wait a minute, wait, that's in there. No, it says what? For the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, this is one of my mom's favorite scriptures. Uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> Uh, basically, if I didn't get a bath, I didn't know Jesus. That's what my mom said. Uh, another one is, uh, follow your heart and believe and you can do anything. Uh, that's actually from the second book of Disney, chapter 3, uh, <laughs> verse 1. Uh, and then the last one, I played my drum for him, ba rum bum 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 That is not in Scripture. Um, there's nowhere, sorry, I just ruined that song for everyone, but it's nowhere in Scripture. And the last one is this, time heals all wounds. Um, you've said that, I've said that sometimes, and especially when there's some sort of, of tragedy that occurs, uh, we instantly say to people, well, time will heal your wound. Time heals all wounds. But it's not true. It's not something that is true. Now, now I agree that some people need time to process things, but time does not heal all wounds. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. You're also going to need your Bibles because we're going to camp out in Matthew chapter 18. But for right now, I want to look at Ephesians 4. It's in your notes. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. There are many here this morning that struggle with this, especially us guys. We, we think as guys that things should just roll off our back and we should just go on. But the truth is, guys have the hardest time letting go of things. We quickly dismiss this, but when we have wounded, we are hurting, and we don't know what to do sometimes. This morning, we're not talking about being mad at God. We're not talking about the vertical relationship that we have with God. We're talking about horizontal relationships. When we're wounded, when somebody does something that hurts us, or there's a circumstance that, that damages us. And so when we say time heals all wounds, when we ascribe to that, uh, we, we basically are saying this as an equation. We are saying when we're wounded, so wounds plus time equals healing. That's what we're saying. If we're wounded and we just give it time, then we'll be okay. Well, well, you need to process stuff, but in reality, that's not the true equation. The equation is this. Wounds plus time equal bitterness and anger. It leads to misery in our life. Uh, show of hands, who in here is responsible for taking out the garbage in your house? Who is it right here? Show of hands right there. There are a couple of you. Your wives are looking at you like, what? You're not responsible for that. Get your hand down. The truth is, uh, people here, it, it, somebody's got to be responsible for it, don't they? Well, let me ask this, families. What if the person responsible for the garbage came to you and said, I've got a great idea. What we're going to do from now on is instead of taking the garbage out, we're going to put it in this closet right here. We're just going to open up this closet every time we need to take out the trash, and we're going to just put the trash in there, and we're just going to close it. The trash is gone. It's gone away. It's not there anymore. Where'd it go? I don't know. I don't know where it is. It's in the closet. And so we'll just do that plan. Now, how long do you think that plan would last? Maybe two or three days. Maybe, okay? What would happen after a while? 
Well, the garbage would begin to stink. The whole house would stink. And then it would be a bigger problem than it was before. You see, when we are wounded, when something happens in our life, if we just say we're going to let time heal it, we're just throwing it in the closet. And what we have to do is get it out. We can't leave it in the house. If we leave it there, then it will start to fester and stink. And so we've got to get rid of it. So what heals our wounds? If time doesn't heal our wounds, what does it? Well, I'll submit to you this morning this. The way to heal our wounds is forgiveness. And you ask, Russ, why are we talking about forgiveness? The holidays are here. It's Thanksgiving. It's Christmas. It's a season of love. We're supposed to be talking about other things. But that's exactly why we need to talk about forgiveness. I read a report this past week that um, people had been disinvited to Thanksgiving dinner based on who they voted for in the election. Okay? We need (laughs) forgiveness in our country. We need forgiveness in our church. We need forgiveness in our families. We need to apply that, and especially at the holidays. I know it's tough for a lot of us uh, at the holidays and dealing with forgiveness and dealing with hurt, and we need to talk about that. So how do we choose peace? Well, look in your notes. Here's a few things to help us to choose peace. First of all, number one, we have to keep life in perspective. We have to look at the big picture. And I understand when we're hurt, It's hard to do that. It's a very hard thing to look at the big picture and keep life in perspective, but we have to. Look at Matthew chapter 18. We're going to walk through that here and and see what Jesus is talking about. Here in this story, when we come to this, uh, this this, this parable and this exchange between Peter and Jesus is actually sandwiched in between uh, talking about church discipline and talking about divorce. And so Jesus is dealing with this overarching idea of forgiveness. And we come to verse 21, and and Jesus is talking with his followers here. That's a very important point, that he's talking with Christ followers. He's not talking with the world in general. He's not talking to the masses. He's talking just to Christ followers here. And it, it says this, Then Peter, verse 21, came up to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Now, you may or may not realize this, but at that time, Peter was being a little gracious. He was trying to be nice. He he was coming to to Jesus, and and he was saying, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Now, now also, Peter was kind of like that guy in college, you know, when they passed out the syllabus, and he'd raise his hand, he'd say, Professor, what's the least amount of days that I can come to class and still pass, okay? Do y'all remember? Maybe some of you were that. Those of you who were laughing were that guy, okay? And and so Peter's saying, what's the the limit? How, How many times can I forgive somebody? And the Jews at this time taught that you had to forgive somebody three times. If somebody did something to you, you forgave them three times, and then they're done. You don't have to forgive them ever again. And so Peter was being gracious. He was being generous. He's saying, Jesus, since we're following you, we're not going to do the three times. We're going to do the seven times. Right, Jesus? Is that right? And look at the next verse. But Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. So Jesus says, no, not seven times, not that. I want you to 490 times, crazy amount. It would have blown Peter's mind because he was saying double what the Jews say, then double that, then multiply it times 10. It was an infinite amount of times. Reading on, verse 23. Therefore the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus begins a parable right here. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents, if you were to translate that into today's time, if they were silver talents, it would have been $165 million. So this servant owes the king $165 million. If it was gold, he would have owed him $1 trillion, okay? So let's go with the $165 million, just for a second. If you were to take the average salary in America, it would take this servant... 6,500 years to pay this back. So think for just a second. Don't miss this point. The fact that this servant owed the king more than he could ever in 6,000 years pay him back. Reading on. Verse 25. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the king says, look, I'm just going to try to get some money out of you, so I'm going to sell you, your kids, you're going to the prison. Now in the prison, he couldn't work, he couldn't make any money, he couldn't pay the the king back. But also, there's a finality to this, this, this judgment from the king. You see, because not only did he throw in there the guy, he threw in his wife and his kids. He basically, the king is saying, I'm ending you. You're done. You're finished. You are no longer worthy to be on this earth, and your family tree is evaporated from the earth. It's done. It's not going to be there anymore. 
Verse 26. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Now right here, the people that were listening to Jesus would have kind of snickered a little bit. Uh, They would have kind of sat back and thought, yeah, pay everything? How in the world is this guy going to pay the king back? He can't do it. Verse 27, and out of pity for him, the master of the servant, the king, released him and forgave his debt. He forgave him. He gave him mercy. That word forgave the debt means to take away or to leave. It's the same word that you find in the Lord's Prayer where it says we will forgive others as we have been forgiven. It's the same word when it says that the the disciples left their boats and followed him. It's that same word that that, that when Jesus healed the the little girl of fever, it said that it left her. It's it's this finality. It's this taken away. It, It basically is saying this. Here's what Jesus is saying. This guy, this servant, instantly went from the end of him, the end of his family tree, it's done, it's period, nothing else can happen, to now having forgiveness and having a new life, period, done, nothing else can happen. This guy instantly went from the end and from a horrible ending to a brand new beginning. And don't miss this, because it's a very good picture of God's forgiveness. Has God forgiven us? Yes. He's forgiven every sin. And many times we try to earn it. You and I try to earn God's forgiveness. And the fact that we try to do that is actually laughable. It's actually ludicrous. It's, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. And God is not annoyed by us. He doesn't just tolerate us. He has forgiven us. And we are now sons and daughters of the King. The purpose of the cross is to restore us to the Father. It takes us from a huge debt with a certain final ending to a brand new beginning. Reading on, verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That was about $9,000. It's, it's, it's a good amount of money, but still not what he had just been forgiven. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. Verse 29. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him. Now notice, this fellow servant says the exact same words that the other servant said. He said, have patience with me and I will pay you. And what did the unforgiving servant do? He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. In other words, he put him in prison where that servant could never repay him and he sentenced him to the same sentence that the first servant had. Verse 31. When his fellow servants saw this that had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you plead with me, and you should not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. And in his anger, the master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do with every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This servant got a new lease on life, and what he did is he used it to condemn somebody else. This servant had been forgiven so much but yet he couldn't forgive this little bit that he had been owed to him. I, I, I'm scared or I'm, I'm, I'm fearful that many of us, many Christ followers, live in a virtual torture chamber. Uh, you and I have known people that, that have lived in this, this thing of unforgiveness. And, and, and what we do is we affect not just our life, but we affect the people around us. I read a true story about a guy, 73-year-old from South Dakota a few years ago, Uh, He rang the doorbell of his old high school buddy. Uh, So he was 73. This would have been 50 years. Uh, And and then he he killed him. And they began to research why this guy did this. Why this, this classmate of his, what happened? And it turned out that in the 1950s, there was something that happened, and this guy never forgave his classmate. He had held on to this grudge for half a century. And one person interviewed said this, I know of no one that remembers exactly what happened or acknowledges it other than Carl, the guy who who killed the other man. Another person said this, or, or Carl said this, he said, I wish I could just turn the calendar back now. He held on to that grudge for so long. And many of us live in torture chambers where we don't forgive other people. And so we've got to keep life in perspective. We've got to have this perspective that when we are hurt, we, we tend to focus on ourselves, but when we hurt with others, we need to remember that our relationship with God vertically should affect the relationships that we have horizontally. It's really easy, easy to lose perspective. Uh, I heard about a guy that uh, got a parrot as a gift, 
And uh, he had this parrot, and, and he, was, he, was, he brought it home. And the parrot began to get obnoxious. And then he began to get rude. And then the parrot began to scream profanities at the guy. And so the guy went over and, and was going to pick up the parrot. And when he picked him up, the parrot started attacking him and started eating his arm and all this kind of stuff. And so the, the, the guy didn't know what to do. So he just took the parrot. He opened up the freezer door. He threw the parrot in, and he closed the freezer. And he heard the, the parrot go around for a little bit. And then all of a sudden, it got really quiet. And for a minute, the, parrot, the, the man thought, oh, I just killed the parrot. And so he opened up the freezer, and there was the parrot standing there completely calm. And he looks at the man, and he says, Sir, I realize that I was rude and obnoxious, and I said some things that I shouldn't. But I assure you, from now on, I will be very nice. I will, I will treat you with respect. And I promise you, if you'll forgive me, that I will live here under your house uh, in, in, in great, great, great order. I, I will be very, very well behaved. The man was shocked. What happened? And so he looked at the parrot and he said, what happened in there? And the parrot said, well, I just have one question, sir. And the man said, what? He said, what did the turkey do? <laughs> we have to keep life in perspective. And if we don't do that, then we miss out. Another issue here is found in Hebrews. It says this, Hebrews 12. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking diligently lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many are defiled. You see, many people who are bitter, they don't know it because they can't see it. Bitterness grows under the ground. It begins slowly, and then it grows. And if we use time to heal our wounds, time doesn't heal the, the root of bitterness. Time just allows the root of bitterness to grow even more and more and more. And the longer you go, the deeper the root grows, and the harder it is to remove it. We have to remember, guys, that we will never be asked to forgive more than we've been forgiven. We will never be asked by God to forgive somebody else more than the debt that we have had paid. So first, we have to keep life in perspective. Secondly, we have to be willing to make the first step. C.S. Lewis said this, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until he has something to forgive. When we are wronged, there's a debt that's automatically generated. There's a payment that has to be made, and we need to be the ones to take that first step. And it's not just about forgetting. It's not just about selective amnesia. Uh, even God said this in, in Isaiah 43, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. We, we get confused. We think that forgiveness equals forgetting, but it doesn't. Forgiveness is canceling a debt. You know someone owes you, but you don't make them pay. You don't hold a grudge, and it may cost you something, but you have to be willing to take that first step. If you notice in this verse, it says that God blots out. He covers. He wipes our sin. He deletes it from his view. He looks at us, and he sees Christ. God doesn't forget our sins. He looks past it. It's even better than God just having selective amnesia. God looks past our sin. He doesn't make us pay what we owe. Also, forgiveness doesn't equal weakness. God never wants you to stay in an abusive relationship or one that enables other bad behavior or lifestyles. That is not forgiveness. That's enabling. We have to remember what Jesus did for us when he forgave us. He forgave us. He took that step even when he didn't have to or need to. Jesus forgave us. So be willing to make that next step. And then number three, we have to choose to forgive. Choose to forgive. I want you to circle in your notes the word choose, because that's the, that's the primary word here. Going back to Ephesians 4, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. That word put away uh, in the Greek means to raise or to take up or to lift or let it be lifted or let it go. Let it go, let it go. We could make millions, couldn't we? You know, <laughs> if we just write a song about that. Let it go. Forgiveness is not a feeling, it is a choice. You say, I don't feel like forgiving. I don't want to forgive them. You don't know what I've been through. Well, I don't. And maybe you need to talk to a trusted friend or a counselor or a small group leader or someone if you're having trouble. But we, you and I, must choose to forgive. Well, why? Why should we choose to forgive? Well, here's a few things of why we should choose. First of all, you are never more Christ-like than when you forgive. When you forgive somebody who's wronged you, when you forgive somebody who has, who has hurt you or hurt your family, you are never more Christ-like than at that moment in your life. 
Next, you remove the poison of bitterness. You take that root that would be in your life and you pull it out before it gets time to get in there and dig in there with time and, 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 and make it so that it'll be hard to get out later. And next, you experience the peace of God. Some of us wonder why God doesn't use us, why God doesn't do things in my life or my family. It's because there is this soil that is filled with roots of bitterness. And God chooses to work with people who are rooted in grace and forgiveness, not in bitterness. So how do we do this? Just some practical steps of how to apply forgiveness in your life. First of all, ask for God's help. You need to ask for God's help because our ability to forgive is rooted in God and God alone. Next, you have to transfer the debt owed to your account. Transfer that debt. There's a, there's a financial term called debt assignment. It means taking the debt from this party and transferring it completely and wholly to this party. And so we've got to take whatever debt somebody owes us, whatever, whatever, whatever that is, and we need to transfer it to God and give it over to God and let him handle it because God is the one who can handle it, not us. Well, what if they don't ask me to forgive them? What if, what if they don't tell me? Transfer it anyway. Jesus forgave people on the cross that never even asked for it. You are saying with this that it is no longer a debt owed to me. It's owed to God. It's God's problem. God is the judge, not me. It's all about him. Next, refuse to rehearse. This is very important because, especially us guys, we tend to rehearse things in our mind. We go over and over and over it, and we can't do that. We've got to refuse to rehearse the hurt and let that go. The next thing is if they knew of your anger, then they should know of your forgiveness. If they knew that you were angry, then they should know of your forgiveness. In his book, Lee, The Last Years, Charles Flood reports that after the Civil War, Robert E. Lee visited a lady in Kentucky who took him to the remains of a grand old tree in front of her house. There she bitterly cried that its limbs and its trunk had been destroyed by the federal artillery fire. She looked to Lee for a word condemning the North or at least sympathizing with her loss. After a brief silence, uh, Charles Flood reports, Lee said this, Cut it down, my dear madam, and forget it. Cut it down and forget it. It's better for us to forgive the injustices of the past than to allow them to remain, to let bitterness take root in our lives and poison the rest of our lives. See, church, time doesn't heal all wounds. Forgiveness does. Time plus wounds equals bitterness. But wounds plus forgiveness equals healing. Today, we'll celebrate communion as a church, and that is a great reminder of the forgiveness that you and I have been given. As we take that communion, we remember the great debt that we owed and that Jesus Christ has forgiven us, that God has forgiven us because his son went to the cross. And so in this season of thankfulness and of Christmas and, and of love that we're in, may we walk in grace and may we leave here today ready to forgive others for the wrongs that they have done to us. Let us remember Ephesians 4 that says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And also Colossians 3, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Basically what Paul's saying there is this, Christ followers, we who have been forgiven much must forgive quickly and completely. We who have been forgiven so much sin, so much of a debt, must be ready to forgive others for what they do to us.